Welcome to the Massey Dialogues. I'm Hannah Hogue, a Williams Southern Journalism Fellow at Massey College. Thank you for being with us today, both in person and online. First, I would like to start by acknowledging the land. Massey College is land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is the treaty lands of the tri and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the traditional territory of the Huron and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship towards the land and the great privilege that we have to live and work on this land. Today's Massey Dialogues is called Omiwatari, a documentary screening and discuss discussion on the cultural losses of climate change. Massey Junior Fellow Zisi Powers brought this idea to us and we want to thank her for bringing her documentary and our esteemed panel here today. For those of you who are joining online, you should have a link to the video in the uh, invitation. I would like to in introduce Zisi before passing it off to her. Zisi Powers Art practices, Practice explores updated systems that shape our society. For two decades, her work in VR, machine learning based apps, video and performance have screened and exhibited internationally. She is currently researching deep fakes as digital kidnapping through a Canada Arts Council grant. For her bioethics MHSE, ZC is researching how remote hearings in the Consent and Capacity Board impact processes and outcomes for patients contesting sick detention. She produced and directed Omiwatari over an eight-year period out of a conviction that this story is a gift from the communities and researchers involved to the future. Thank you. Do we have do we have interest, interest with these guys? No. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess Sabna, you have a little presentation for mm -hmm. today that you're going to give, um, just to get some scientific background on what's what's going on behind this, the more emotive aspects of this story. Yep. Yep. That's true. So if Joe wouldn't mind putting it on the screen. Okay. So today I just wanted to talk. Just to complement Zizi's film uh, and to bring in the scientific knowledge that we've gained from studying uh, studying this lake. And um, before I begin, Joe, would you mind um, going to the next slide? Oh, okay. Now it's working. Okay. So just before I begin, I just wanted to, uh, I'm a scientist, so the first thing I, I do is acknowledge uh, the team uh, and many people who are involved. Uh, first and foremost, I need to acknowledge my mentor, John Magnuson, who discovered uh, this record, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Miyasaki at uh, the Sua Shrine, uh, who has been us with data going back to 1443, as well as some of uh, my team members. And um, I'm an ecologist. I study the impacts of climate change on lakes in different aspects. And lake ice is one of my favorite topics to work on for several reasons. So first, uh, it's a sensitive indicator of climate. And what that means is that water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. So if the temperatures are below zero degrees Celsius, give or take a few Celsius, uh, lakes will freeze. And the timing of when a lake freezes and in the fall and thaws in the spring gives us an idea of what the climate is like and how climate might be. And lake ice records actually go back further than most ecological records, most even human, um, observations of climate uh, as we have I think 2,500 records I've, I've collected now that go back um, 100 years or more and uh, and the Lake Sua record is actually the longest most consistent ice record going back to 1443 and ZZ talked a little talked about the Amawatari so I'm not going to do that here um, but that's something that uh, the Shinto priests, 15 generations of Shinto priests have recorded uh, since 1443. So they record the date that the ice freezes, they record the date that the Amawatari appears, as well as the size of the ridge, the direction of the ridge, and as Zizi alluded to in the film, it's used to forecast, was used to forecast rice harvest uh, in the region. 
And Could you maybe touch on a second, like, sure. is there a temperature difference between just freezing and only Watari happening? Yeah, so it has to be cold. Um, it has to be even colder for the Ama Watari to form. So that's why in some of the data that I sent you, you could see that the lake froze, but the Ama Watari didn't appear. So, yes. Um, and so my collaborator, John Magnuson, went to uh, the shrine and worked with Mr. Miyasaka as well as um, the limnologist there, Shia Rai, and they converted data from rice paper and diaries, old diaries, into Excel spreadsheets. So you saw some of the Excel spreadsheets that, that we had. And so that's where I came in because uh, I, I do a lot of modeling, uh, statistical modeling. And so I'm going to share some of the information that we learned. And this is a very simple of and something's really simple that we can understand with lake ice. So on the x-axis we've got time and on the y-axis we've got the years with no ice. So in the first 250 years of the record the lake did not freeze three times. If you look at the next uh, 250 years um, we have more instances of not freezing. Um, and the Industrial Revolution began in Japan, so they started uh, deforesting the landscape. More people started coming in in, in the late 1700s and the 1700s. And you can see in the last like full 50 year period that we have, the lake didn't freeze one out of every five years. Since 1988, the lake was actually not freezing eight out of every 10 years. And we've done some future climate projections using like every single climate change model and scenario out there. And even with really aggressive greenhouse gas mitigations, there are no scenarios that project that the lake will freeze again after 2040. And so if you look at Lake Sua and you look at a variety of other lakes that are experiencing these conditions, you can see winter air temperatures on the x-axis and the percent ice-free lakes on the y-axis. And as we approach that magical number of zero degrees Celsius, you see that more lakes are expected and experience ice-free winters. And Lake Sua is not actually the only lake that experiences these ice-free winters. In the last 30 years, these we're seeing more lakes that historically froze every single winter are starting to experience these ice-free winters. So here I worked with the New York Times actually to create this graphic um, for me and uh, from some of our models. And what you can see is that with temperature warming, we are expecting more and more lakes to, to lose predictable ice cover. Uh, some, for example, like Lake Sua, that may permanently lose ice cover within this century. So why? Um, We've like, the other great thing about working with Lake Sua and other ice records is we have data going back before the Industrial Revolution and we have these long-term time series that addresses some of the concerns that climate change skeptics and deniers sometimes have. And so we're able to like quantify how, what the role of climate change is. And the most important factor is increases in air temperature driven by increases in CO2 emissions and green, greenhouse gas emissions. So that is contributing to these shorter ice cover periods. Local weather like temperature, rainfall, snow cover, wind events, that affects like within the week. Uh, that helps you predict if a lake is going to freeze or thaw. And these large scale climate drivers, uh, El Nino Southern Oscillation you might be familiar with, North Atlantic Oscillation and Solar Sunspots explained some variation, but not very much. And then we were able to find really cool patterns because of the long-term time series. So the top panel here is actually from Torn River, which goes back to 1693. And the bottom panel here is uh, Lake Sua. And this is a wavelet analysis. And what I really want you to focus on are the red blobs with black circles around them. And before these lines, so there are lines in the record, uh, and those dip, depict the start of the Industrial Revolution for those, uh, for those uh, water bodies, you can see that there are these long-term blobs, those, long, those red circles. They're extended 32 to 64 and even like 128 years. 
After the Industrial Revolution and these increases in greenhouse gas emissions, those long oscillations have disappeared from our records. And what we found was this fundamental shift in teleconnections. So for example, the North Atlantic Oscillation. If you read textbooks and you look up what the North Atlantic Oscillation is, it's an oscillation that is 20 to 50 years. But it seems as if that since the mid 70s, it's more at a six to 10 year period. And I'll talk about why that's important in a second. El Nino Southern Oscillation. So you hear about El Nino years, El La Nina years, and how they affect weather, uh, not only in Ontario, but Australia and California. Back when the Shinto priests started recording these data, those cycles were 50 to 60 years long. Now we're looking at a two to eight year cycle. What does that mean for us now in terms of more extreme events? So when you have an El Nino year happening more frequently, you have these warmer years uh, that are warmer than just depicted than you would expect by uh, climate warming alone. We're also seeing changes in ice thickness and ice quality. This is actually my son who is helping me sample uh, this ice during the, during the pandemic. And our lake in um, Richmond Hill was one of many across the world where we all work together to sample ice quality. And what we noticed is that ice is becoming uh, whiter, um, which is less strong, weaker, less stable uh, than the black ice that forms when conditions are rolled. So because of these, you know, you can, this winter is a perfect example, right? We have warm, warm winters, cold days, warm days, rain, uh, rain in the winter, which was not really something that we saw before. Um, that's all contributing to decreased ice quality, which is actually corresponding to more drownings, uh, fatal, fatal winter drownings in warmer winters. So what I did here was uh, reach out to police stations and coroner's offices and life-saving societies across the Northern Hemisphere. And again, you see as temperatures approach zero degrees Celsius, this exponential relationship with more drownings through ice in warmer winters. There are a few exceptions. Japan and Germany and Italy actually have very strong laws and regulations about who can go out on the ice and when. Uh, so they have a few drownings. In Japan, actually, to relate it to this story, um, drownings are most likely to occur in bathtubs um, because of really hot temperatures and they uh, put the water um, quite high. But Northern Canada, uh, the territories had the highest winters per capita than anywhere in the world, especially, it's especially concerning because the temperatures are so cold. And that's because of the importance of ice to uh, indigenous communities to, for fishing, for hunting, for travel on snowmobiles, and we're seeing increased uh, fatal drownings. So what's the solution? There isn't a solution. Uh, it's mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So if we work towards mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, you see very different scenarios um, with the number of lakes that are expected to lose ice cover either in a year or, or permanently. And, and this is important for preserving cultural, um, cultural heritage, such as the, the Suwa, um, and Shinto tradition, but also ecologically, and that's something that I also study, is when you have less ice cover, we have, you know, ice is like a lid um, on a lake in the winter, and if you lift that lid early or you lift it completely, you have increased winter evaporation, uh, which decreases freshwater availability. Also have uh, warming water temperatures, which affects our water quality and the higher prevalence of, of algal blooms, some of which may be toxic in the summer. So there's these cultural losses, but also ecosystem losses that arise because of losses of ice cover. And so that's, uh, that's just my little spiel on the science that we've, yeah. that we've learned from, from this SUA record. Thank you. Uh, it's, um, it's amazing to see your more recent research, because the last time I visited your lab 
was just before I went to go shoot this mm -hmm. in late 2019, early 2020. Yeah. yeah, so I'm trying to work towards, so I've worked on climate change for a long time now, since I was a junior fellow here. I was a junior fellow here a long time ago. Um, and, and I do a lot of science communication and public education around uh, the issues. And I used to spend a lot of time forecasting what would happen in the future. But I moved to the US for a post where it's filled with climate change deniers. And, um, and they really wanted to know what was happening already, what we could see in the past. So that's why the ice record was so powerful. And then from there, people don't care about ice, to be honest. Um, it doesn't, so trying to relate it to people has been something that I've been working on a lot. Like, how do we relate ecology and the study of lakes to people? And could that be used in an effort to maybe engage more conversation around climate change and what that means for freshwater security? And so, you know, research is ever, so, and I'm trying to, that's what I'm trying to think about now. Yeah. I, I would like to jump in and ask Zizi because it, this is a perfect moment where, so Zizi was one of the first researchers on our Anthropocene project, the, the film. That was a cool project to work on. Exhibition yeah. and books that we did with uh, photographer Ed Patinsky. My husband Nick and I, Zizi did a lot of that research and it's, it, what's fascinating is this intersection of art and science and how um, they each can illuminate each other, each other in a way that I think is quite unique, right? And so um, in, in, in the Anthropocene project, just as you're saying, it's a connection of people to, how do you connect people to science? The whole mm -hmm. of that project and the Anthropocene working group is to get people to acknowledge that humans now change the Earth systems more than all natural processes combined. And mm -hmm. What does that mean if we actually acknowledge that we are in a different geological epoch, um, the Anthropocene instead of the Holocene epoch? But this, and, and, uh, and when you look, I read the, God, it was a slog, but the, the, the Cambridge University Press um, <coughs> book of findings of the Anthropocene Working Group, which, trust me, I mean, maybe you people in this room would love it. It was so dry and it's all graphs and everything. And you just think, oh God, nobody's ever going to read this. How do we make this day come alive um, in a way that actually can uh, move people? And I think that that's also what you were doing in your film. And because we talked about it so long ago, I had no idea that it so took long that ago. long. Uh, yeah. But I want you to talk a little bit about how your approach to bringing those two things together. Mm. I think I, I have to say, like watching this, is really sad, and then seeing your presentation, I feel really sad. Um, which is not what you know. We don't want to feel so sad we don't act. Mm -hmm. um, in this, I mean, yeah. What something I was so struck with with your research was this idea of these narrative data sets, where the data itself tells a story, and I think. I mean, we looked at a lot of the uh, AWG <coughs> uh, research there, and it's true, it's like, how do we turn this into a story? And with the data sets that you have found and that you work with, the story's there, it just needs to be told. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it made it really, it made my job very easy. Um, and I'm somebody, you know, I'm not, I'm not a scientist, um, I'm a bad activist, I I'm not here to tell people what they need to do to fix this, but... I am. Yeah, <laughs> she is, yeah, she is. I'll do that. She I'll, is, I'll yeah. I'll be that overbearing yeah. person. Anyway, go but, on. but for me, I really felt that um, what is so striking about these, these cultural losses of climate change is that it's not overwhelming in the same way that, like, well, well Australia's on fire, Australia's gone. Like it's, it, it, there's more room to kind of realize that it's like, okay, we've just lost something really valuable and important, but this is also like a sign that we need to change and move forward, which is a lot of the people in the community, that's very much where they're coming from mm -hmm. as well. Um, I mean, talking to parents sometimes, for them, you talk about their childhood, but they refuse to talk about the future they saw for their children because 
they're seeing it so rapidly and in real time in this cultural way, nobody's making them leave. Mm -hmm. They can still drive a car, they can still heat their homes, they can still go to the grocery store. But the, it was it is, uh, quite a trigger for them to know that something was deeply not okay. Um, I don't know really where I'm going with the that. The story of the path and that and the freezing is very much an example of this art and science because mm. it's a way of understanding it. And the thought that they've been collecting that data for so long is just mind-boggling. It's been longer than just 1430. According to Mr. Miyasaka, the priest, mm -hmm. this tradition goes back millennia. And this area has been inhabited continuously since for about 20,000 years maybe longer, which is like, I, we, I can't comprehend that 20,000 years of like what that would have been like to live then. So it's the data we have is like kind of recent compared to the cultural significance of this annual, you know, climactic <coughs> geological event. Um, and I think that gives it even more. I don't know if I was able to convey that completely here, but just, just knowing that gives it so much more, uh, it's so much more meaningful as a loss. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Japanese have been incredible at keeping records. Probably all heard of the cherry blossom records from Kyoto and those go back to the 800s that they've kept and then used to reconstruct climate. But that's, that's interesting to hear. Can you talk a little bit about your experience with Mr. Miyasaka and the community in uh, when you visited? Yeah, like I mentioned already, you know, parents, but also the, the snowball effect. You know, we would talk to Mr. Miyasaka, he'd be like, talk to all these people. We talked to the woman who ran the, you know, the, the ryokan, the little um, bed and breakfast we stayed at, and she was like, oh, you should talk to these people. Um, we reached out to, I found out through connections of my own that uh, Epson, the printer company, is headquartered there. Um, and when I reached out to them, they were like, please come and see what we've got. Um, and so, yeah, it was very, I think like the... What did they have? It's interesting. They've become very focused on, I don't know how much of it I can give away, but like pu the public thing that's available to see, they've got this machine that can recycle paper without water within the office building, which is actually cool. That's mm -hmm. useful. That's great, um, but I think what was, yeah, like there, there's this idea for people who are living there at least, like they're, they're trying to do the best that they can, but the most, I think the most striking figure is of course Mr. Miyasaka because he's carrying on this tradition um, and he feels an incredible personal responsibility not just to maintain the record, not just to maintain the tradition in the face of like the inevitable loss of what you're supposed to be waiting for. Yeah, this inevitable event will no longer be inevitable. Um, but in addition to that, he really sees himself as a science communicator as well. And this is why he's so excited to work with people like Sapna or with myself. Um, every year when they go and they do their final check, the national news is there. So it's become a bit of a national climate check-in as well. And this combination of, of culture, but also of um, like this real this this emergency, because in Japan they know that climate change is real and nobody's nobody's concerned it's a hoax. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. I couldn't speak to any like active happening that, on that end, but it is interesting to see people like the candy maker in the film, or even you know Epson, this global company that are very much sort of like okay, how do we adapt and change to this new reality? where we need to be able to, even on, never mind a cultural level or a commercial level, continue to exist. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to maybe ask of both of you. Um, so CSIS, the Canadian spy agency, just released a report <laughs> where they were like, guess what? It's this good, we're now facing a period of inevitable incremental change in the climate that is going to be disastrous in all facets of society. And this sense of like absolute like public urgency from government and agencies also supposedly apolitical or whatever is, is quite new. But, but Jen, as somebody who's been working with these issues and ideas 
forever. Has this, has, have the ongoing and like very tangible changes that we perceive every day in climate impacted your sense of urgency in what's happening? Yeah, I mean, first of all, happy International Women's Day, everybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. Um, I think that it's kind of interesting because the, we've always been concerned about these issues and I would say that most of the, a lot of the work I've done is, has, you know, either focused on art or these issues. Payback was a, a film that we made, an adaptation of Margaret Atwood's Massey Lectures and, um, you know, the lectures themselves were very much, they were pretty academic in the sense of, you know, unpacking this idea of what it, what it is to owe. And so finding these stories that um, illustrated the idea of debt without that, that weren't necessarily in the book. And I remember um, moving that and then going into the work that we did with Ed Bertinsky, the trilogy. And Ed's work was very much about um, uh, being revelatory instead of accusatory or witnessing instead of, of, of um, blaming. And, and I think that that worked uniquely with the kind of photography that he did, which was, you know, they're large scale photographs because it's such high resolution in terms of the way that he shoots them. You can see hundreds of details in these photographs and it's a, it's a real dialectic between scale and detail. And certainly in our work with him, we tried to do that as a way of conveying um, the issues, the issues around water, um, the Industrial Revolution in China, and then in Anthropocene. But in a way, the, our activist friends, and believe me, we have a lot of filmmaker activist friends, were totally pissed off that the films were too soft, like that they were, that they were about, they were an attempt to shift consciousness rather than an exhortation to act. And I, I think with the last project, because it was so long and intense for all of us, like five years of sort of flat out, um, and going all over the world again, and then also asking yourself that question, is the energy that I'm expending to do this project worth the whatever it's going to convey? I mean, you think about that, if I'd have just stayed home in bed, we would have, you know, um, we wouldn't have spewed so much carbon. We wouldn't have, so about that too. I still think about that, but the, mm -hmm. the, the latest film that we did, which opened the Hot Docs Film Festival here in May, is called Into the Weeds, and it's about um, glyphosate, it's about Roundup, it's an anti-Monsanto film, and we, mm -hmm. the whole time that we were making the film, it was a secret, all of our funders agreed to keep it a secret, we said we were making a film about insect collapse, and for four years we they didn't know. So it wasn't revealed until a month before the opening what the film was actually about. And I would say that this is a long way of answering. It's the most politically um, inflammatory work that we've done. And it's not a polemic. It is an absolutely meticulously researched um, film about a court case that uh, and the science involved in this court case about somebody's cancer being caused by this chemical. And because uh, you might not know, I know Peter will know that um, errors and in emissions insurance is something that you need to be able to show films. Like you can't just make claims and then you know send them to a broadcaster because people can be sued. And so in the past we've done lots of E&O, you know, and it's it's relatively straightforward. In this case, the 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 amount of work we had to do to clear the, um, any, any claim that was made in the film was backed up by evidence and mm. triple checked. And so it, it, it's an absolute record. It's a record of corporate malfeasance. It's a record of um, agency capture. It's a record of the limitations of mass torts and other ways um, of, uh, a, 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 as tools for justice, et cetera. And it's about the science. And so I would say that my sense of urgency, especially because of the effect of this herbicide, which is the most widely used herbicide in the world, everywhere, um, and its effect on biodiversity and biodiverse line. And so this is the first time that we've done a fulsome impact campaign. And I mean really like trying to influence regulatory review in Canada, the US, and the EU. And I have to say there's something kind of liberating about not treading softly. But it also came because of this 
um, sense of urgency. Mm. I mean, that's it's inspiring, but also just such an indicator of how hard it is to to fight against these systems that you need all of these resources behind you to prevent yourself from you know, being sued into the ground, to make sure that this film is actually seen by people, to make sure you're allowed to film it in the first place. And yeah, I think it makes sense that urgency is the fire that would have made that, that happen. And for you, Sapna, you've been in a, a different context because as a scientist, as you mentioned before, there's just people who've been like, this doesn't exist <laughs> for, for decades. Yeah, and I think most scientists live in a world where, you know, we're in our labs or wherever, and most choose not to interact with the public. Um, so there's a lot of my colleagues and my scientific community who, like is really versed in what's happening in the lab and and really understanding what the urgency is but not being interested in communicating it more broadly mm -hmm. so or not knowing how or not knowing how or you know whatever whatever reason um so i feel like you know scientists are always like we, we're stereotyped, right? As the as the people who are like running around with their hair all wild and just trying to warn people and um, whatever. But no, like the scientific community has known this for years, and you know Exxon yeah, officials has known this for years. have known this yeah. for years. Yeah. Um, how many people are we going to let die because of climate change? So. You know, some of the latest projections are the three billion people may die in the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, they're all brown and black people, so are people going to care? They haven't cared to this point, uh, which frustrates me to no end because that's why I worked on that drowning study because I was like, these are white people drowning. Are people going to care about that white people dying? And yes, lots cared about that. I think we got like one billion media impressions on that on that work. But every day, there's you know, Pakistan is one third underwater. Middle East uh, and Asia have temperatures above what humans can withstand. Um, we're already at that point. But are we doing something about it? Well, and um, we're taking down everything with us too. Like that's part of the uh, the biodiversity piece is without all of these things working together, um, we none of nothing survives, right? Yeah. But yeah. There's, did, does anybody know the scientist Bill Reese, William Reese, who he used to work at UBC, and uh, we talked to him in Payback, and he he was sufficient to coin the expression ecological footprint and he developed ecological footprint analysis with his graduate student and he's such a smart guy but he he talked about how you know we have these adages like think globally but act locally mm -hmm. and and his point was that we as humans don't even understand the complexity of one tiny ecosystem one lake you know we don't we don't understand that so we really have the capacity to think globally actually we should be thinking about um, protecting and, and, and um, nurturing the, the ecological systems that exist in our worlds instead of um, blithely going around or blindly going around changing them um, to our own ends. And that, mm -hmm. that's also an anthropogenic um, trait, you know, and the, I think, the arrogance. I think also recognizing all the lobbyists out there who are sort of dictating the public discourse and the public knowledge about about these actions, you know, we did something about the ozone hole. So when I was a, a kid, the ozone hole was a huge problem. And there were conferences and accords and people came together and figured out what the, what, um, what the solutions could be or alternate solutions. But I think in this case, we're working against lobbyists. We're working mm -hmm. against Money. people who it's not stand just, to make it's money. It's not just lobbyists though, like with, with CFCs, it impacts one industry, refrigerants, yeah. that have lobbyists for sure, 
but it doesn't really impact any other industry. And we are so tied into oil. And you know, in the film, Japan is still heavily reliant on coal. So a good portion of this film was shot in a city called Kitakyushu. I lived there for a year when I was younger as part of um, an artist residency. And that city was at one point the world's most polluted city, the most polluted city on earth. And it was because it was home to the largest concentration of steel manufacturing plants on the planet. So this is prior to World War II and even after it was allowed to continue. Um, there's a lot of tragic stories around this. Um, at one point it, was raining, it would rain concrete, so when it would rain, it would rain concrete. Um, and what changed in this city was mothers getting together and just saying, we're sick of this. Like our husbands work in these plants and that's what pays for our food and for you know, our kids' school supplies and whatever it is, but we're dying here. Um, and so this is this local, mm -hmm. this local thing, this local story, but what we're probably missing from this somewhere is these other pieces of you know, economic history or you know, technological developments that we don't even know what they are, but they actually have more impact on the planet today than like things that we could pull about out of our mind as a Nobel Prize winning thing or whatever. And so yeah, we have we complexities of systems to look at and we have our ability to act and push. We have to literally have our lives on the line sometimes to do something. I mean, I, I love those kids that are like stapling themselves to paintings. I, it Steve seems to have slowed building. down, but I just think that's awesome. I mean, I, like, I, I'm, I'm an artist and I don't care. I would rather see one Van Gogh go up in flames if it's going to maybe convince, you know, enough politicians to vote against a measure that's going to allow something terrible to continue. There's an interesting study, and I bring this up because I get asked all the time about how depressed I am about all of it, and do I have any hope at all, and I, I do, and that's because wherever we go, there are always people trying to do something, but it's, it's by Erica Chenoweth, who's a professor, and it's, it's, she basically did an analysis of all violent and nonviolent resistance uh, uh, through history, and came up with a number that the, the number needed to change society is only 3.5% of the population in a non-violent way, not a violent way. 3.5% of the population can affect change. And she was looking, when you look at something like Extinction Rebellion and what, what they've been doing, they're kind of using that model as an attempt to, um, uh, to, to, to switch things over. So when you think about that, it, it feels plausible, it feels doable, and she illustrates all of these different movements throughout history, suffragettes, et cetera, where it's exactly what it took to tip over. That's not a lot, so. Hmm. That's, that's kind of hopeful. That's, that's a very, very hopeful, hopeful statistic. Hopeful. I'd also maybe put this out there. The city Kita Kyushu, the truly like uh, a propaganda film directed by a famous director starring matinee idols in the 50s was made called Under the Rainbow Sky from the like rainbow smoke coming out of all the beautiful rainbow smoke on the smokestacks. Um, it, I wouldn't necessarily swim in the bay yet, <laughs> but the entire city has now um, adapted its economy to not just renewable energy projects, but also to projects that recycle, that reuse, that develop you know, electronic components that use more energy. Um, and that was political will, that was, that was individuals, families, and that was also a larger political will being influenced by that. I have a question for you, Zizi. Um, so uh, you're an artist, and I think this was your first film that you ever did. Uh, I'm kind of interested in like hearing about like how filmmaking is different than the other types of art that you do, and then would another film again? Oh my goodness, um, I mean, Jen knows all about making films. Um, it, I, I do a lot of, I guess you'd say, like interactive participatory stuff, and it's interesting because um, a big part of why I wanted to make a film on this topic and not like a website or a game was that sometimes people just want to sit and watch and absorb. They don't, don't want to think 
about what, what is the next step in the moment, and I don't want to prescribe to them. You have three options. Click which one. Um, people still love film. We still love film. We still love to sit and watch something and be carried away by it and swept into its, you know, its, its story. Uh, and I think that with this, with this issue, this, this subject, and this story, it's a beautiful story, um, that really, like, a, a documentary was the ideal. It, you know, I, this was, I was not <laughs> feature ready by any stretch. Um, and I, I, you know, watching it, I'm like, oh, I would have liked to have, like, moved this a little longer or whatever. But do you ever feel that way when you watch the, the final cut of something after a while? I think we work on it for long enough um, that, I can, that every single thing is, like, triple thought and it, it drives everybody crazy, but um, a, li a little bit sometimes. I don't really watch them after I make them. Um, I need to. I need to get better at that. At that. <laughs> at the like. At the like triple watching. That's my. It's like me when I write a paper. I don't ever read the paper afterwards. Sometimes when I just hate it by the time I don't even remember I wrote it, and somebody will have to remind me like, oh, you know, your study when you did this. I'm like, actually, I totally forgot about it. Yeah. It's. Uh, mm. it are depends. we gonna have a Q and A? I think we are. Um, we're going to open it up to the floor if anybody has questions. Oh, are you going to make another film? Am I going to make another film? I mean, I, oh God, I, I need to have a sustainable life. <laughs> so I don't know. Yes, Pro it's, yes it's probably. It's not a way to get probably, rich, yeah. let's put it that way. Yeah, but. yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to in the future. I'm, yeah. Yeah, one of, the, one of these days. It's got to be the right idea, mm -hmm. the right time. And the right, it has to be the right medium. And the right, for, yeah. For mm -hmm. the the project. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for this film. Um, it is very emotive and also a little frightening. But uh, I don't have much of a question, really. But I just want to uh, add my observation to this because when you talk about uh, drying, in my own country, there's a lake, it's called Oloborosat. It has dried completely. Mm. And with it, livelihoods, bad life, human activity, farmland, everything is going to, I mean, it's almost, it's like looking at an extinction film in slow motion, knowing that it's gonna happen, it's gonna get worse, and being helpless to do something about it. So I think that uh, this is an awakening and a call to each and every one of us to do what we can in our own little spaces because a little work here, there, here, there builds up to something uh, really great. Now, uh, to the lady at the extreme uh, left speaks about uh, Santo and what uh, they have done and they are doing to human life and environment. And I think that uh, we, we cannot deny what's obvious, because I think I've shared with Zissi in an informal setting about what is going on in, in Kenyan communities, rural, especially where people depend on uh, peasant farming. Chemicals that are not allowed even to be used in the US within 100 kilometers of human activity are being used in our farmlands. Consequently, we've got astronomical cases of cancer our parents are dying of cancer, our grandparents are dying of cancer, our food consumers, we, we think that a lot of our food should be clean and organic, it's been contaminated. Oh. Now, unlike uh, places like this where probably there's some law to check what is happening, uh, most of Africa is an open field. Everyone, every person with something nasty to do will try it there first. So I think that uh, this is a call to action to do more. Anybody feeling like doing a film about this? I have been talking about it until I'm tired. It, you know. <laughs> yeah, talk to me. Thank you. Beautiful yeah. and terrible. Yeah. Did anybody else have a question? Say the boss, Massey alum from the early 70s, and I might remind you that ours was the House Committee member that initiated the, initiated the um, access of Massey College to women. 
so happy Women's Day. Anyway, yeah. so you, uh, the assumption in your movie was that if the story is told, it will make a difference, mm. right? So let's put it to test, you know. I mean, I, I taught uh, business and engineering. And, uh, you know, the, what we, uh, what we um, cherish is a standard of living, you know, pursuit of uh, life, liberty, and happiness. And the higher the standard of living, the better it is, you know. And standard of living is computed by amount of things we spend, amount of earned plus what we borrow, divide by the number of people in the system, the higher it is, okay? Now, in nature, right, uh, and in engineering, you know, the matrix is just the opposite. What most you can get from the amount of resources you spend, right? In the sense that uh, how many people you have for the amount of spend. So, uh, so my question to you is, is that after, now that you obviously have seen the movie, and you're aware, right, uh, of, of, of the problem, uh, the uh, standard of living is one thing, and the opposite, existential efficiency, how many you can get. How many of you are willing to trade existential efficiency for standard of living? How many of you are willing to spend one third of what you spend right now? Or, I mean, don't shed a tear for blacks and browns, because they are doing a marvelous job at spending about one thirtieth of what we do, and having population here, in order to maintain the standard of living, either you have to produce more, which we can't, or decrease the numbers, which we are doing. Depopulating here. So we are more in danger of depopulating than the blacks and brown that you make. Okay? So my question is how many can candidates, can how many are you going to uh, like to follow existential efficiency rather than standard of living? How many of you? Any, any takers? I'll take, I'll take that. Oh, wait, I've, I've got my mic already. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's maybe like a bit of a that that it's a bit of a false dichotomy increasing efficiency requires lowering the standard of living and that's something that's prevented us from increasing efficiency is that we'll often be like oh well yeah like I can't we can't reduce whatever because my life's going to get crummier some of it is like what we assume to be necessary is not really necessary and just having to let go of that which is culturally going to be very difficult here. A lot of people really like to live in a detached home with a certain number of bedrooms and a car for each, you know, income earning adult in the driveway. And their standard of living could be improved with things like public transit. But we have a problem where we don't think that public transit improves standard of living in this country, at least. So it's, it, I think framing it as these two competing things is, is not helpful in, at least in, in the West here, in, in pushing people to actually do something about it. Because if we feel like we're being like, oh, well, I'm being asked to give up my, I don't know, whatever, cool phone. <laughs> or like, I'm being asked to give up my cool car, a much bigger one, not just from emissions, but from the resources and the, the land use that's just wasted on cars. Um, Anyway, that's my, that's my thought on that. I don't know if you guys have anything. There's also a real, I mean, when you were talking about lobbying, and we, we, we have to also recognize that economically in our system, we're, we're, there really are um, a very small elite that, that has a lot of power and a lot of money. And I was thinking about how when we tried to buy an electric car about, I don't know, I'm talking about, 10 years ago, like r r r at the very beginning of electric cars. And nobody, all, they, all the car companies had the, the model, oh, this is going to be our electric car. Nobody had any. There, there were no cars. And it tried to get on lists to buy cars. And we would, and they would say, yeah, we'll have one in about two and a half years or three years. And it just became extraordinary that we're in this climate emergency. We, we know that electric is viable. We, I, I, I'm sure many of you have seen Who Killed the Electric Car. That's an enraging film to watch because it was really about putting the interests of oil companies and companies ahead of I the interests even, of the I would planet. even argue, though, that like the electric car is a bit of like a there's a there's a nice tidy word for this but like it's it's a bit of a a distraction from no, the real issue no, which no, is no 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 it's true but the, the 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 point and of course i've been we've been to the lithium fields and there that there there are problems with that too batteries etc my point there is that what we learned 
car dealerships don't want people to buy electric cars oh, because they don't require any maintenance. And the reason that electric, the, the reason that car companies and dealerships make money is because you keep going back to get the oil changed and you get you get the checks, especially when you're leasing a car. And so you have these lobbies that you don't even know yeah, that exist I didn't know about that. That's wild. that are preventing yeah. these things from 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 happening. And it was wild. extraordinarily frustrating right. um, and still is quite frankly that 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 we're we're mm -hmm. as not as far as we could be so it's it's those mm -hmm. kind of hidden things mm -hmm. i think that we we the more those are uncovered that, that that we can move forward and i think we have to there's individual actions that we can all take and i think a lot of nowadays are taking those actions whether they be to take public transit or be vegetarian or skipping out on flying on something or whatever actions you take. And those make a difference. But at the end of the day, like industrial, if you don't change what's happening industrially, you don't change the government laws, it doesn't Our individual actions are meaningless without compared systemic without change. the systemic well, change. Well, yeah. hence the 3.5%. Let's just all remember that. That's a yeah. nice thing to remember. There's an online comment I heard from somewhere. Yeah, there you go. Oh, wow. that's nice. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That's so nice. <laughs> that's so sweet. Yeah. Yeah, thank you all for. Oh. Yeah. Those are nice. Oh, Those are lovely. Nice. I, I'm only doing this because I have to leave. Um, She's got checking the like time. Coming up in five minutes. Oh, okay. Everybody should come and see to the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, which I am a co-programmer of. It's our opening night tonight, and it's playing till Sunday at the Bloor Cinema. Free. You just have to register that you're going. Mm. But they've been free, and it's also available online for free until the 19th of March. And it was hard to pick the films. But we've picked five really incredible film so please come okay. anyway that was my little plug um, hi um thanks so much for sharing today um a really exceptional um project and, and story um i'm wondering if we could backtrack a bit um I, I pieced together a little bit about how um cz you got were connected with sapna um but i i'd like to hear a little bit more about that um, oh, yeah. And, and so how you came across the, the in like research. In 2015, yeah. maybe even 2014, I went to an RCI lecture just at the med school here, as was my hobby. <laughs> and Sabna gave an amazing talk. And like often at the RCI, it would be like weird stuff. And this was just so compelling and um, like such an incredible way of talking about climate and what's happening. Um, and I knew, like in that moment, I was just sitting in the audience, I'm like, I'm going to make a film about that. And it took a few years to convince her I was serious. I think she had like no idea, like, I was just like, well, I'll make a film about you. She's like, okay. <laughs> well, we get strange emails all the time. Yeah, um, okay, to so, be fair, yeah. Yeah, so it was out of the blue. I didn't know who you were. Um, and then you kept connecting with RCI, I think, and then the executive director told me, well, there's somebody named Zizi who's like written something about your talk or something. Did you write, didn't write something? It? I was just like very persistent. You were very, very persistent. persistent. Yeah. And so then she came to visit and I'm the type of professor who gives like all students a chance. Like <laughs> I have sometimes people are like, you know, you have like a weird lab because it's like a mishmash of people. And I'm like, I'll give anyone a chance because um, that's just who I am and an opportunity you so in that lab it's like that yeah and so um so Zizi was like you know I want some money to go to Japan to do this film and I'm like I don't know who you are really but you seem passionate about this and maybe this could work out um so sure and and that was kind of but it, it took a it took a few years that money got me to Japan and w after that trip and the footage we shot and just like obviously the connections we made with this community who are so excited about this, I was able to get a significant amount of funding to finish it, which mm -hmm. was like incredible, absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. So yeah, and also just like a background, like yeah, Jen and I worked together on the films she directed with Ed Bertinsky and that was I, just an incredible learning experience with you.
Yeah, I mean, it's a very anthropogenic thing. Do, just doing the book and doing the fact checking for that was really fascinating and, mm -hmm. and arduous. And, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we're, we, we were in it. Our heads were in it yeah, for we were a long time. Yeah, we were deep in it for many years. Yeah, I think I like both of you. I can t consider uh, like mentors and partners in some way, like working on these things. So it's it's such a pleasure to just be up on this stage with you and to share this like very little film, right? Because at the end of the day, we're we've been talking around this idea of like action and what can we do, and it's not like it's not like action has to mean for everybody in the streets and self-immolate or whatever. Like there's. Or protest. Yeah, yeah, there's there's all kinds of things we can do, but the in intentional understanding that like this is real and actually change needs to happen is really important. Otherwise, the goddess and the god will never meet again. Yeah. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> no, it's got it's got to happen. We got to make it. Yeah, it's really sad. I'm laughing because I otherwise I would cry. Thank you for asking us. Yeah, thank oh you. Gosh, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming to check us out. Okay, I have